episode of Galaxy Pirate Radio, where this time we are reviewing the Talons of Wen Chang. Ooh, and I am joined today, I'm your host, David Beauchamp, and I am joined by my two co-hosts, Angela Pritchett, and Drew Meyer. Yes, um, so let's jump into this thing. Um, what did we like about Talons of Wen Chang? Jane, <laughs> God, why do I keep doing that? That's fine. You're doing it because we planted the how awesome it would be to get a poster made by Patrick Dean. This is the town of Wang Chung, which is being designed and will be up on our website hopefully within a month. Yes, nice. the towns of Wang Chung, but not that. We're here to yes. talk about the towns of Wen Chiang. And we're actually um, talking about the special edition, which came out on DVD um, a couple months ago. Um, it's one of the rare three disc. Oh, let's be really nerdy here. And let me... We don't have to craft together. We're ready. Ooh, ooh. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Everybody? See, yeah. Everybody? Wait, 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 wait. Oh, I have two copies. I have, the original I have copy. the novel adaptation. Wait, is that the original? It's the original oh, nice. novel adaptation. Ooh. Actually, I wanted to read something for you. Just to start off, for those of you who haven't seen Wen Chang, yeah, um, it I is considered cool. to be um, one of the top five classic Doctor Who's um, in... Um, Doctor Who Magazine's 413th issue, they did the top 200 episodes of Doctor Who, and that included Classic and New Who. Um, the Caves of Androzani came in number one, Blade yeah. came in number two, Genesis of the Daleks came in number three, and the Talons of Wen Chiang came in number four. Um, so if you remove Blink from that, this is number three, right? So here we go. The original release, uh, which came out in uh, 2003, so we're already looking at almost a decade since this has come out, that was a two-disc set at the time. It says the Doctor brings Leela to Victorian London to meet her ancestors, although Agincourt might have been more to her liking. The TARDIS materializes in the darkest heart of the city where life and death are anything but dull. A hapless cabbie is slain by agents of a secret Chinese cult. Young women are disappearing in the alarming rate. And Li Hsang Chang, the palace theater's celebrated magician, may know more about it than he admits. Li Sen's ventriloquist dunny Mr. Sin... Uh, appears to have a life of its own, and the rat problem in the sewers is bigger than anyone can imagine. So there's actually humor in this this one, which, uh, read our oh, newest one. Yeah, let's read the, yeah, you got me wanting to do that. Death stalks the fog-bound streets of Victorian London. Young women are going missing. Horrible mutilated bodies are found floating in the Thames. And criminal gangs terrorize the innocent. At the heart of this tangled web sits the mysterious Li Han Chang. Uh, sorcerer and hypnotist, and his grotesque psychic, the all-too-lifelike ventriloquist dummy, Mr. Sin, the Dr. Don's deerstalker hat and cape to seek out the sinister forces lurking in the shadows of the, the metropolis. For the talons of Wing Chang are reaching out to shred the human race. A little melodramatic there, but... Uh, very, very <laughs> melodramatic. The talons of Wen Chang will shred you. Yes. Um, and I actually think they pull the bodies out of the fleet, not the Thames, but... Besides that, um, there's pretty good. So obviously, this is one of those Doctor Who DVD releases that that warranted a special edition, and by special edition, they made it a complete extra disc yeah. of materials, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Yeah. But I believe that you wanted to find out what we thought. So well, actually, actually, I'm really curious. What did the novel say on the back? It's the Victorian London of Sherlock Holmes, of Sherlock Holmes. shrouded in sw swirling mist. Doctor Who confronts diabolical horrors as he unravels the mysteries surrounding the strange disappearance of several young women. Doctor Who learns a Chinese magician, the crafty Chang, spelt differently, mind you, and his weird midget mannequin, Mister Sin, are mere puppets in the hands of the hideously deformed Greel, passing as the Chinese god Wing Chang. It's Greel who steals the young young women. It is Greel who grooms. Groom sewer rats to do his bidding, but there is even more, much more. Will Doctor Who solve the Chinese puzzle in time to escape the terrifying talents of Wing Chang? 
So what I love about these is news novels came out um, 30 years ago, and of course they still refer to them as Doctor Who, which is something that um, I know no one had really necessarily decided on, because even in Troughton's time, um, they were referred to as Doctor Who, and even uh, Troughton, um, sorry, um, Pertwee has the Who-mobile, which actually says Who won on it as yeah. a license plate, so he wasn't just the Doctor Who, he was Doctor Who, and so of course we come up with that, with, uh, with those. Of course he gives away way too much in the back of that book. Um, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> I, I love though how they spelled Chang, C H A N G, and Sen, if it was actually for Chinese, if it was a Chinese name, because it's a Chinese puppet, would be T S I N. Well, technically, Mr. Sin isn't even uh, Chinese. He is uh, a homunculus yes. and from. But if it's a Chinese spelt name, it would be T S I N because he's being. Just being technical, since you know. Well, I mean, I wouldn't have known that. <laughs> so, what did you think of of this DVD or I like this love story this number? This episode is horrendously racist, which is really funny because I find racism funny, not good. So, and they're very quiet. <laughs> no, I'm that. just giving you the moment and for you to to speak your piece. Just, there's a lot of humor in it, so I just. I love Leela in this this episode. She's so funny. So, what do you think? Uh, this ranks uh, up there with my favorite of the classics. Uh, I will say this is one of the few Doctor Who classics. Um, I'm now done with my chronological watching of Doctor Who. I beat it within a number of years. I have eleven episodes, still a little left to watch, but there are ones that some of I think about five or six of them haven't come out yet on DVD. So. Um, this is the Wen Chang is one of the few episodes I've seen more than twice um, because it's such a good episode. Um, it's also one of the few six parters that I feel yeah. actually uses its six part time to a, to a benefit. I mean, I'm sure they could have condensed it uh, into four episodes very easily, but I didn't feel um, kind of that, that by the third episode, knowing it, you have three more to go, going, oh God, what are they going to do to make this drink? And a lot of that has to do with. Um, obviously, Robert Holmes' script, which is brilliant. Um, this is the the last of Hinchcliffe's um, episodes that he yeah. was producing, so they really seem to go all out with it. Um, along with that, you've got amazing, amazing acting. Um, and, and not just with the Doctor, because we were kind of at that point where the Doctor is obviously still very cold toward... or uh, Baker is still very cold towards Jameson, um, <laughs> and you can tell that there's some... They split them apart for most of the episode, um, but they're still really good. Remember, Leela has only been in this is her third episode, so episode. Face of Evil, followed by The Robots of Death, and yeah. Wen Chang. And we're talking about uh, three just excellent uh, episodes so far. In fact, I feel like um, Leela's kind of movement into Doctor Who mythology is some of the best, uh, with maybe the exception of The Invisible Enemy, some of the best Doctor Who out there. Um, but then you've got uh, Jago and Lightfoot, which absolutely steal the show, um, especially Henry Gordon Jago. Um, so, yeah, I know, I loved it. I loved it. Which is interesting. They don't mention two of those characters on the back, but they're just, just such a huge part of the entire story. Um, I did not realize this was a six-parter when I started, mm -hmm. because it's been such a long time since I've seen it. And I'll say this. I was just like, come, I was like, come the fourth episode, I'm like... Wow, that is one amazing way to end an episode of Doctor Who. Oh yeah, because the Doctor loses at the end of the fourth episode. Yeah, it's very... and I mean, and, and they and they're riding off as they want, and I'm just like, wow, that's pretty awesome. And then it then it continues can, continues on. Um, that has a lot to do with uh, a formula that Hinchcliffe was working on yeah. at the time, where if you have to do a six parter, and they recognize the fact that six parters were fairly strenuous to deal and with. My question is, how many six parters did Baker actually have? Okay, so his last one was Armageddon Factor, the one before uh, Shada was supposed to be before that, yeah. and then this one was, so you're looking at, um, uh, he did for seven years, so I'm thinking he had four? Really? That's interesting. Four, four five of the max, I think. Because but Could be wrong, it's one of those things I have to go back to. Check. Yeah, because, because honestly, this did not feel like a six-parter. You know, it, it, it flowed so well. Um, it, honestly, it, it turned out to be much better than I remembered. 
Mm -hmm. which I was very, very happy about. Um, I find it very interesting that Dr. Luce, is, he doesn't wear the scarf in this episode at all. Not once. Um, the only episode that Tom Baker yes. is in. And he's wearing more of Dr. Or Dr. Who. Um, Sherlock, a more Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. I love um, Sherlock Holmes. I was so excited for yeah. this one. And the original design for the costume actually did incorporate a scarf, which they dropped, um, which was interesting in the documentary. And this is also the only episode or the only story um, that Leela wears actual clothes and not her leathers. Um, the actual clothes, especially when we're thinking about the bloomers. Is, yeah, the bloomers. Stuff. Yeah, which is which is interesting, and it's also the only one where she screams. Yeah, the screams. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting to see that the scream came at actually at the end of uh, one of the episodes. So it was a cliffhanger scream, mm -hmm. which I found very very interesting. I mean, I thought that was a good use. Um, In our interview with Jameson from yeah. Face of Evil, um, which of course we reviewed several episodes back. She said that, you know, she was determined not to make Leela ever scream except for that one time, um, and she gave her reasons for it, and that has a lot to do with her yeah. physical discomfort, fear of rats, and <laughs> the fact that she was physically being mauled by a giant yeah. stuffed rat. Um, yes, yeah, so that was, Actually, it was, a, it was a guy in a costume. It was definitely a guy in a yeah, costume. Yeah, I was, I was surprised, because honestly, I was, I was expecting... Wait, I'm sorry, you were surprised that the monster turned out to be a guy in a costume? costume? Yeah, no, I was expecting it to be a, a giant stuff, you know, like, on a stick type thing. <laughs> a giant <laughs> stuffed rat on a stick. I, w I was surprised that it was, a, it was a full body costume. Sure, sure. Um, that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, overall, I, this was a very, very enjoyable episode, um, and I was really, um, I was surprised. Um... Because I know how Baker felt about Jameson, and you could definitely see that tension between the two mm. um, in it. Um, so this is where we come to the to the part where I mean, what didn't we like about it? I'll start. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm trying to think. There actually wasn't much that I didn't like about it. Um, I think that because. The last two episodes, the way Hinchcliffe set it up um, and uh, Holmes set it up, the last two episodes kind of diverge slightly, and I know that's a way to get the audience's yeah. attention. Um, I think that was... Uh, I think well, I think it could have been a four-parter. A four Having said that I didn't mind it as a six-parter, I think part of it is the length, and I'm just naturally against a six-part episode. Um, mainly because it goes back to the original kind of Doctor Who where they're trying to draw it out. They know they're supposed to get 26 episodes per season. Yeah. Uh, it feels forced in that sense. Um, if you had to really nitpick, the giant rat isn't... It might be the low point of the, the film. I don't feel that because there's a certain quality you're expecting from Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, and the monster costumes are going to look more or less fairly flimsy. There's going to be a flaw with them regardless. Uh, but the production values of this episode are so incredibly good. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe, I don't know, then possibly the resolution with, with Greel. But besides that, it's, you know, you're dealing with Okay, that's the things I like about it, and I'm, I don't want to go back into that and let you guys know yeah. what you didn't like. There were a couple times where they did cuts that were very abrupt. I remember there was one time where Leela was down in the, um, she was down in the little lair area uh -huh. in the palace theater, and then it all of a sudden just cut to this super bright scene of the doctor and the professor in a boat. Oh, And that right. was very yeah. abrupt, and it kind of just had me going, wait, what? Right, sure. Because it was just so shocking, like, they didn't kind of fade you in. They just dramatically cut you in really quick. And you're sure. just like, dark scene. Oh my gosh, now there's a ton of light. Mm. So there were some like editing things that made me kind of just aesthetically and they kind of scared you almost too, the way they just changed from that. But other than that, I really You know it's a good episode when you have, you're trying to fault yeah. the editing of something yeah. made in 1977. But, but no, this, this had so many great things in it though. And I love Leela. She's so funny. This is actually going to be shocking, and I'm going to get beat up by her for saying this. Um, honestly, I don't really think, if there are flaws in it, if there are some bad points in it, they're so minuscule, they're just so tiny, that my brain didn't even pick up on them. I, I thought it was, the, this is a, it, it, it's very understandable why this is number three. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you look at all the classic stuff, or number four, if you look at the new stuff and old stuff together, this is just such a 
a very solid, enjoyable episode that sort of takes them, at times, out of their element. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just have a wonderful cast of characters that, that are throughout the entire episode. They have some incredible villains. So what are you saying you didn't movie. like, there isn't anything you didn't like about Exactly, it. which is pretty amazing for me to say because I'm usually able to find something. But this is just, I can see why this is number three. But no, I will say my favorite part of this episode, there's like one scene that's just hilarious, is when Leela is eating the meat in the professor's oh, house. And is... she runs in there and she grabs the big hunk of meat and he's just like, play fork and knife and she takes the knife she's like this is a good knife and yeah. starts like cutting the meat and he's like she's like you're gonna eat and he's like sure why not i'm not actually sure, sure where the talents of wen Chiang falls in the actual shooting schedule i don't know if they maybe perhaps shot this uh early because this is you know again leo's only yeah. third mm-hmm. and it's the end of the season so leo's already come in but they shoot them out of order obviously and, and so they probably knew that they were going to end it with this um but again, you're still looking at the development of Leela's character, and what's really wonderful, and, and if you watch any of the special features, the thing that they hammer home, uh, old special features and current special features, is the idea of a, an Eliza Doolittle yeah. Pygmalion um, and her attempts to, and in no place in the history of sort of Europe do, do rules and etiquette become more important than Victorian mm-hmm. Europe. And so um, I, one of my favorite parts is also in that scene where um, I didn't realize you were both wearing the same shirt. Yeah. Um, I feel like a little overdressed. Um, is him, instead of correcting her, picking up the meat. Yeah. I was about to say that. But he does correct her, though, with the napkin. And the I napkin. thought that was absolutely brilliant, because he lets her go all, you know, you know, drink out of the bowl. You know, he even joins in eating the meat. But it's like, no, no, no. Napkin. Napkin. Yeah. And that was just... And they even point that out in, in the special features. That was the one thing where... The professor was trying to, in his own small way, you know, bring her, bring civility to Leela. But even though there was also even where the doctor was a little clueless with the female type stuff, when they bring out the dress for her to change into, he's like, well, the clothes really make the woman. He's like, really? Because when he, when he gave her clothing, it was like a jacket and some pants, and then the professor puts her in a dress and everything, and... Yeah. Well, so. also Victorian London was, or the time period was where women were starting to wear bloomers, were starting to smoke, and everything. And I think that's where that first chat came from. But was it was more just the doctors, that. the doctor's whole yeah. thing going, oh, really? When he's like, well, the clothes, you know, you really have to be, yeah. pick the right kind of clothes for women. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, she becomes a kind of a, well, she is very much a demi-mundane, you know, the female Oh, and most definitely. So. No, I mean, it's, and again, we are, if this was being filmed and come out as a modern who, we are the perfect target audience for this. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's more or less steampunk Doctor Who in a Sherlock Holmes vein. And what's really beautiful about it, and you know they, they did this on purpose, of course, is they've essentially substituted the doc, uh, Sherlock Holmes for the Doctor. As oh, if yeah. the Doctor was the one who originated that myth. And it's really something very cool that they do in several other Doctor Who episodes, but more so now. More so in the modern stuff is where the Doctor is that legendary figure. Yeah. Um, he by bringing people back in time or forward in time, they're the ones that set our mythology. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that makes Doctor Who so incredibly clever. Um, because we're talking about the DVD here, of course, we have to talk about the special features. Sure. Um, this is, I think, this might be the first three disc. I can't think of any other three disc uh, special For a single editions. episode. Yeah, there's a four disc for the Dalek War, but that's only because it's a two episode, a two disc. Yeah, version, but it's one case. But the special features on 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 Talons are honestly absolutely amazing because just for the sheer fact they give us a look back of of the Who phenomenon from the 1977 perspective. Let me jump in there because I actually yeah. have a copy of the original 2003 release. So this is what when you get the three disc. You are yeah. getting all the special features that you got on the original two disc, yes. which includes um, the Who's Doctor Who, which is the hour-long documentary. And so that's a lot of it. Is you get an understanding of what the Doctor Who is yeah. like at that phenomenon. They also had the Blue Peter Make Your Own Doctor Who Theater, which yeah. was very fun behind the scenes, twenty-four minutes of the original raw footage. Which, yeah. if you're a film student, that's a little bit more interesting. I feel than 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 your average viewer. Um, it's it's interesting to me, having gone to school for film, to to see that. Um, See what they don't put in, how they go yeah. about it, and see all the actors. Yeah, I watched it all. I thought it was very fascinating. Um, Philip Hinchcliffe's interview was very cool in 1977. Yeah, uh, and then they have the Howard De Silva intros and teases, which they have 
what they call continuities now yeah. in, in the new ones. Um, so yeah, so that's what you get in the original release, yeah. which is really quite good. Not to mention also the commentary by him, Klitsch, Maloney, Jameson, Bennett, and uh, Benjamin. Uh, so that's really quite impressive. However, in the newest release, we have um, a lot of other stuff. Um, ah, give me, give me that one. Yeah. Let's see if I can get no the old one. Let's see if I can actually just take it up to the camera and you can kind of see. So people at home can kind of see. There's that. That's the old one. <laughs> and then here's the new one. It takes up the same amount of space, but it's in a much smaller font. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm holding it up there a little bit longer so everyone can see it. There we go. All right. Some of, some of the stuff I liked off, I'm just going to go off, off this DVD, and I think a lot of it might be the, the newer stuff, is I found, look, there's a, there's a special feature called Look East, where it's a, a 1977 interview with uh, Tom Baker as a doctor. You know, him talking about Doctor Who and stuff like that. I found it very fascinating um, to watch that. He's so ballsy. He is. He, he really is. Um, you know, it's only four minutes, but you could see Baker... Being Baker about Doctor Who. Yeah, it's not Baker as it's, it's actually not Baker as Doctor Who. It's Baker's ego as Doctor Who. Yeah, exactly. Um, which is, you know, I mean, you can't watch an episode of Doctor Who. You can't certainly watch anything behind yeah. the scenes. Yeah. Um, another one that I, I found fascinating from being a um, a library uh, student um, and and everything as as this was a, a wonderful reference piece is the music hall, and the look at the tradition of the music hall in uh, in England both then and now. You know what that piece, and McManus did such a great job with that, um, that piece really reminded me on how special the Muppet Show was. And because we were essentially getting puppets doing uh, uh, music hall pieces. Yeah. Know, variety shows and, and the like, you know. And, the, and we even had demonic puppets yeah. uh, uh, in, in this one, so. Um, Limehouse, which was interesting because it explores, you know, the Chinamen in London um, especially in Victorian London and um, Chi Chinatown, and um, that was very, very fascinating because I mean, it seemed like back then they made Chinatown out to be this really, really huge thing when it was like t two blocks, because they would always repeatedly repeat, uh, you know, just go after the same opium house, opium den, and just keep reporting. So it made it sound so much bigger than it was in, ac in actuality. And we also find out a little bit about the guy who might have inspired. Um, what's his name? The magician in this. Oh, Chank, yeah. Yeah, and his um, and his untimely demise in World War II. Killed by his own bullet trip. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, which was on the original DVD, which really stood out was the uh, um, Who's Doctor Who? Um, and that was just absolutely amazing watching um, the 1977 version because they even talked about how Doctor Who was affecting children back in the day. You know, if it was scary. And I, and I gotta say, that's where you really see Baker's attitude. You know, in one scene where he's just like, I am Doctor Who, I know more than the writers now. I mean, he really goes off in that. Um, but I think this is some of the, actually some of the best uh, special features because they're not actually focusing on Baker's tenure as the Doctor, but just Doctor Who history and the history of, of the setting in which this was set. Um, you can tell that the people that put together the, the special features of this really, really loved the setting and what they did with the talents of Wing Chun. I mean, they, th they put so much effort into the special features. Um, it, was, it was phenomenal. I really enjoyed them. Did, and, I mean, chime in. I mean, did you? I mean, what did you think of the special features? I already like this. I love this DVD. It's why I bought it. So you know, I was already shooing for liking everything on this DVD as it is. So, since I've been asking forever to do this episode, what what did you think about the special features? I love the special features. I, I, I half the time I actually like the special features more than I like the actual the episodes themselves because. Um, and it's going to be a very long time coming before we, we do um, Doctor Who and the Web Planet. But, you know, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the original um, William Hartnell Web Planet, it's, it's almost painful to watch as an episode of the special features blow you away because you understand um, where it was really like filming a theatrical production. And, and here in, in the 70s, uh, it's, it's a, a lot has changed. But I love watching this. I love the little stories. Um, 
I like to have those little tidbits of trivia. Yeah. I love to... I, I wish, and this is one of the things that every time you see these special features, especially... Um, what was it? Second through fourth doctor, third through fourth doctor, um, makes you really wish that Robert Holmes had been interviewed, yeah. um, had been alive to to go into, because I want to hear his descriptions of the writing process. I want to have it from Holmes' view, because everyone else speaks so highly of him. Yeah. I believe, I'm, I'm trying to think of the entire history of Doctor Who, and I'm, I'm pretty sure no one has ever out and out said, I hated Robert Holmes. <laughs> I know there was a disagreement once or twice about who gets credited for a script. Um, but this is one of those things where this seemed like the unobvious. This is this is if nothing else. This is League of Extraordinary Gentlemen before League of Extraordinary yeah, well, Gentlemen. Most most definitely. Um, this is very much one of the things we actually didn't talk about. We didn't talk about Bennett as Chang. Um, <laughs> and this is it, yeah. and it, it talks about this in the special features. Oh, the un it, it understanding does. of how much they didn't have uh, Oriental actors to play the parts that they deemed of a big enough stature to, yeah. to be on the show. So, of course, what they do, they take makeup. And, and makeup. And good makeup, too. I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that he looked like a living actual... There's, <laughs> something, there's something kind of sinister about him. He yeah. himself looks like his own kind of marionette. It reminds me a lot of um, Joel Grey from Remo Williams, where, like, yes, they could have mm -hmm. gotten the Asian sensei, uh, but, of course, they're going to take this um, thin dancer from Cabaret and put him in... Um, a false mustache and beard and let him beat up um, that actor, Fred Ward. Yeah. Um, so again, jumping off there, but um, it's still, and, and the racism. Okay, so let's there talk was, about the racism. There was one, my comment earlier when I said racism is, racism is funny is because racism is stupid. So right. no, we, no, we bad, know, no bad yeah. comments down on the YouTube channel for me. We know that, that you're racist and it's understood mm -hmm. and that's part of your charm. Um, but again, I think... It got a lot of flack. Yeah. Um, but no, it was just that one scene where the um, the police chief guy is trying to like just randomly sprouting out words, and the Chinese guy's like, "What?" And then the doctor sits down and is like, "Ni hao ma," and he's like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. speak my language, and then he goes off Baker and, and continues yeah. to speak absolute gibberish yes. for the next gibberish. It's the only thing. It's like, "How are you?" Yeah. And then it's not Chinese. Well, at the time, and I know that it, it talks about who's Doctor Who speaks about this a lot more, um, about kind of the backlash they got from this. This is certainly one of those classic Doctor Who episodes. It's very famous for a number of good reasons. It's also very famous yeah. for a number of negative reasons, this being one of them, Deadly Assassin for the Drowning, um, yeah. Vengeance of Varos for the Acid Bath. You know, people remember these. This yeah. is also the height of kind of the White House Mary Whitehouse um, era, and, and so, of course, I'm sure she wrote some very nasty letters to the paper. But at the same time, it is also a very much a reflection on how people were treating. And there's a certain, they capture the racism of the time. The Limehouse, I found to be particularly interesting is from a historical standpoint, yeah. of explaining, no, Limehouse, and, and it, was, it wasn't saying that racism didn't exist, it right. just said that the portrayal of Limehouse as a, um, and they use a really wonderful word I'd never heard before, I, a chinoseri or something like that, yeah. that, referring to essentially like saying English, but saying Chinese, um, how it described that time as being incorrectly viewed, Sax yeah. Romer's Fu Manchu, and so on yeah. and so forth. Um, what I found really interesting was the fact that um, there's a young woman by the name of Wichard, Dr. Wichard. Dr. Oh, Ian yeah. Wichard. I shouldn't say young woman. I apologize, Dr. Wichard. Dr. Wichard exclaims um, how a lot of uh, English women were marrying Chinese husbands because they made good husbands. Yes. And I'm like, she doesn't go explain that comment, but I thought that was very interesting. But it also, it talks out through the whole film that white women are disappearing when they go to that Chinatown. And, and you shouldn't take Leela to that area because you'll see horrible things. And I think it's a reflection yeah. of the time. that almost mm -hmm. feel like they did the research. Um, it was a they were, period piece. It was a period piece. They were doing their... I don't know if the racism was authentic, but it certainly was uh, elevated to the point kind of to that fictional line. Yeah, but also I don't feel like they beat you over the head with it. I mean, it was there, but it wasn't. they weren't like trying to drive home a point. Mm -hmm. Because I think if they were trying to drive home some sort of, you know, point, it, it would have well, killed the episode. I, I noticed it just because I took three years of Chinese. Yeah. So when the police chief started saying stuff, I was like, that's not 
Right. Yeah, so I'm not expecting yeah. him to, to, to yeah. know anything. But it yeah. was just funny because I sat there and I listened to him, I was like, wait a minute. Which, I mean, honestly, I mean, how many police chiefs would actually know, you know, would be fluent in Chinese? I mean, I, I think... there's some words that they keep bringing Chinese guys in. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, since we're reading this special edition, how many tardi uh, would you uh, give this? Five. Easy yes, five. five. Easy five. Five. And five of these little guys. What? Oh, I was just like, I, I have no idea what you're showing. And um, honestly, I Woo. mean, I was able to get the DVD on Amazon for $25. Um, and I have to say, for the money, for the three discs, if you really want to know the history of Doctor Who and get that 1977, 1977 perspective from the special features, and just, this is a wonderful resource just, I think, about the Victorian London time period, especially with dealing with the Chinamen and the music house, uh, music houses. I mean, I, I can't disagree. This is a, a five TARDIS uh, set. And I and I really think that the special features, and I really do think that the special features really elevate this um, this DVD set. I mean, it is well worth the money I spent on it. I I am thoroughly pleased with this episode, and I can't wait to go back and watch it with the uh, info text, so I can just get a little bit more because I, I really enjoyed the info text. Um, I think it would yeah. be worth five. Um, Derpy Tardis is by its lonesome. I really feel like this is one of those ones, if you're going to collect Doctor Who, if you haven't seen this episode, mm -hmm. is it worth purchasing? If you're planning on collecting Doctor Who, this should be in your, your top five classic Doctor Who episodes that you should pick up, with, without a doubt. In fact, I'll go out and say it, if you've got to pick up only one Tom Baker episode, yeah. you it would be hard-pressed to find a better one. Um, I can think of maybe two others that I that would rival this one for the top spot. I mean, I would say it would be like four Derpy Tardises for myself without the special features, but the special the special features is what really does it. And if if we had a higher scale, I would give this even more Derpy Tardises just for the special features alone. It's a it's a great set, and yeah, I have to agree. If if you're gonna get one Baker story, this would be it for me. The next one would have to be Robot, just because it's his first direction. one. Yeah. Or um, like Lock Ellipse because it's his last one. I'm, I'm a big fan of the first and last episodes, regardless of how good or bad they are. Sure. I'm a fan. Sure. Robots of Death is much better. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying those other two episodes are great. By Terror means. of the Zygos. And actually, ro I would say Robots of Death. Um, but And then um, the next episode after this, I believe, is Horror on Fang Rock, which is my first favorite three quarters of a Doctor Who episode, and the, the uh, fourth one, fourth episode of that one kind of falls slightly. Um, but we get to see um, Louise Jameson's real eye color, uh, which is kind of cool. You know, they're making wear work yeah. contact lenses. Also, if nothing else, um, Louise Jameson running in bloomers through a wet uh, sewer is also worth the price of admission. So do we have any more things we want to talk about about uh, this DVD release? Or are we good? Because we got a, we got a little bit more to go before we actually end this episode. We've got some surprises going on here. I'm good. Okay. So um, sadly, at this point in time, um, there is no new new Doctor Who news. Sure. Now, when this episode comes out, well, no, there is the new ep the new episode's name, the assimilation of the Daleks or whatever. I thought that was sort of common knowledge. I didn't think no, that was that's new. new news, oh. though. Oh, but hey. Not everyone ha would have known it yet. They've announced the name of the first episode. By the time you see this season. episode. Assimilation of the Daleks, or whatever yes. it is. Oh, wait, oh, and the other the other thing is, is not only are we going to see one of every dialect that's ever been, we're going to see two of every dialect that is, that's ever been. And they just fished one up in England a little while ago. Yeah, that was a couple months ago. Yeah. They found one in <laughs> they the They found lake. a salt and pepper shaker randomly in the lake. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah they, they're not sure from they, they had to call in the bomb squad because they thought it was like a World War II like, yeah. nuke or something. I know which Dalek that is. It went into the yeah. It was one of the ones they in the ponds. Yeah. Pond. Okay. I can't remember the name of the episode. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. So it's not they. Yeah. They. I thought you said they didn't know where it came from. Oh no, they they didn't. But it's a lot once they you see it. There was a dog, a very famous theft of a Dalek, um, from one of the episodes, and uh, because of the theft, <laughs> they never found it again. Uh, they had to get a private collector who built their own Dalek to bring it in, and perhaps. Well, this maybe one was found in a lake. Yeah. It was only like part of a Dalek. 
Yeah, I, I think they knew. I think it was just, they just sort of were this like, but it was sort well, of one of those There's supposedly a story for, I can't remember what episode it is, but they had the Daleks on like rollers, and one of them actually rolled into a lake and they just yeah. never got it out. And then all these years later, they, right. they freaked out. And then they fished it out thinking it was something like a bomb yeah. that just hadn't detonated. So they actually called the bomb squad and they're like, no, it's a Dalek. So um, while what, what you're looking up, yeah, what you're we, looking we, up. The internet um, in, this, in this room is not very good. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about next month, July, um, which is in about two weeks when this episode airs, we get the uh, special edition of the Cro Crotons. Crotons. Crotons with uh, Patrick Trotten. I'm very excited about that. Excellent. And um, we also get... I don't remember what the other one that's... Death to the Daleks. Oh, that's right. Which, the Pertwee episode. Which I really want to review because... I can't always remember what, what some of my first episodes were. I know that was one of the first episodes I saw with the dialects. That might be the first dialect episode I ever saw because to me, whenever it came on, I had to stop and watch it because I just absolutely love that episode. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to feel about it now, all these many years later, but when I was a kid, I always had to watch that one whenever it was on. I haven't seen it, and I, I, I don't know, uh, I purposely don't know anything about it. Yeah, so. it's it's one of my all-time favorite dialect episodes, just because I have such fond childhood memories of it, because it's one of those ones I actually remember, I don't know if it was my first dialect episode, but it's one of the first ones I actually remember. Sure. Um, so that's very exciting. Do you have any luck? Well, no, it, we're, we're under a ton of concrete right now, so... Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue Safely. on with. It's not it's not gonna work. It's well, gonna dream of I time. got a box here. I got this magic box. He's a madman with a box. I'm a madman with a box. With a cardboard tonight. box. With a cardboard box, um, with some stuff for Angela here, um, which I'm very excited about giving her. So, because it's puppy. It is. It, it's not a pug. I'm I'm sorry. It's not a Doctor Who shaped pug. Oh, that's just scary. Okay. First thing I got for you is this old Target novelization of, of Doctor Who and the Seeds of Doom. I thought the cover looked really, really cool. And I didn't know if you had that like, one or not. I don't have this one. It's like Cthulhu attacking a building. Yeah. It's actually more <laughs> like the thing yeah. from, from this, the, the yes. remake from John Carpenter's. And then for and then I also got you this wonderful uh, uh, Doctor and Amy print uh, from... Ben Templesmith. Ben Templesmith. He did the 30 Days of Night comics. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. And he even signed it to you. Thanks, Angela. Yeah. So that that's spelled my name wrong. Did he really? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it just means I would have had to get him at uh, NC Com the NC Comic Con to mark out the name and spell it right. Oh, I'm just joking with you. So um, that's that's for you. Um, those were little things I picked up at Thank the you. last con I was at with Drew. Um, I was at the con. I didn't get anything. No. No, I didn't. I didn't give it to him. Oh wow, that sounded really bad. Well, um, do we, we have a room together? Is there anything else that we want to um, talk about this week about Doctor Who, or are we good? I'm good because I'm out of stuff this time. Oh my goodness, you don't know what to say or talk about. That happens every once in a while. <gasps> Not often. Not often at all. Sorry, to disappoint. Well, so then this is. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say? No, I'm good. Okay, so this is uh, GPR signing off. Let's go. What about it? I'm on tonight. It's hard to find you. What about it? I'm on today. I never felt so far.